thank me, uh, th thank you so much for, for for having us here, having Checkpoint here, having myself here. Um, basically, I'm, this is the first time for us for Checkpoint to be present in this uh, community. So I'm uh, very excited, basically, for this first session, but also for the many other sessions uh, which basically follow. And I hope that one day I can enjoy your also your beer ops, right? I saw some some very interesting like pictures in in LinkedIn. So would be happy to be there one day. So as mentioned earlier, the, the session today is about uh, basically how to build a zero trust level supply chain. And of course, uh, as you might assume, this is a process, right? So um, what I will do today, I will have uh, a few slides. So I try to make them as small as possible, the amount of slides, right? Just to give you some kind of basic understanding, right? And I hope I don't need any slides anymore in my, ne in my next uh, sessions, because I assume you watch this once. And then, of course, it's a continuous process. Um, so I will start with a few slides, and then I will give us some ideas like what happens on the developer front. So what is developer-first security? Uh, what kind of role does this play, basically, in, um, in, in, in building a zero-trusted devil supply chain? I have lots of content with me, right? We have uh, integrations into, into GitHub, for example, into GitLab, into uh, Azure DevOps. Uh, we look in all of these details today, right? But again, the focus is about developer first security within the zero trusted DevOps supply chain. And there are further sessions to follow, which for example, handle things like, like application security, things like how to build uh, like an application security process in an Nginx uh, ingress controller. So this is all something which will follow. And today I will start uh, with that session. And uh, as I mentioned, I have a few slides just to give us a little bit of context. Why this is happening? Why this is now important? Uh, why we see this in the in the market actually? Why so many organizations are looking at this now? And one of the reasons is uh, is basically that uh, cloud security is becoming more and more and more important, right? So there was one very interesting uh, report from Verizon. Uh, basically, this report is from 2021, but it really highlights. Uh, what is basically happening out there, right? And and this report basically uh, gives an understanding that the number of breaches we see in the cloud has now surpassed surp surpassed the on-prem breaches, and this is really a significant news, because before the years, I mean, before 2021, the numbers of breaches and on-prem always have been higher than the breaches basically happened in the cloud. And, but this has now changed, right? And of course, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, for myself, I see many organizations now moving from typical monolithic applications into microservices. Many organizations are obviously consuming uh, Kubernetes. They're consuming serverless functions. They are exposing APIs, right? And, and all of these things, of course, have consequences uh, from a security point of view, right? So there are a few like reasons here on the left, data is truly everywhere. This is exactly what we're seeing. Uh, customers, they are, they are doing these kind of like moves into microservices, um, basically in their private cloud data center and the public cloud. It's a multi-cloud, multi, multi -cloud, hybrid cloud environment. The workspace, and this is also something which is basically, of course, uh, even more triggered by uh, the pandemic, is, is more and more um, hybrid, right? The digital transformation is moving on and it's not stopping, it's getting faster and farther, faster. And with that, the attack surface basically has never been wider, right? And when I talk about attack surface, you can think about it like this. For an organization, right, it is important to protect basically against everything, right? While, uh, while for an attacker, they only need one single point of entrance. So that's a very important uh, message. And, and you see here now, this is what happened in 2021, and it has significant impact, basically. So now let's look a bit to some details. And there are some breaches here I just wanted to highlight. Uh, one of them is, for example, the Starbucks, Starbucks breach happened um, end of 2019. Uh, in fact, an API key has been exposed by accident by one of the developers. And uh, attackers basically used that uh, API key to gain access to internal systems, right? Another um, example is here from, from CodeCov, which is about an extensive supply chain attack. And uh, this extensive, extensive supply chain attack is basically lead to an, uh, let's say, to a breach where hundreds of customer networks have been exposed. And we see these kind of attacks happening more and more and more. And look, for, for myself, and I'm doing this kind of, you know, this kind of role now since a while, um, the majority of, of, or let's say, the, all of these supply chain attacks and, and these kind of things, they become, became more public 
after the SolarWinds breach basically happened. So this was a this was really a time in history when change, things have changed when and people started to look more into the solar supply chains and people started to 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 thought about more like what is actually needed to to secure a supply chain, right? So this was a time usually when this happened, and since that time we see a constantly growth in these kind of attacks, and we have seen recently a large number of attacks also in Australia. You know all about what happened. I don't want to go too too deep into that, but you can see that these kind of things they they basically continue, and I'm I'm pretty sure in the, in the next years we see like these kind of attacks are actually going to increase. So now, when you look a little bit uh, how this all belongs together, right? And there's one thing what I always like to talk about, and this is basically how basically you build such a supply chain. And as I mentioned earlier, for, for many organizations, um, they are investing heavily in Kubernetes, right? So when you think about Kubernetes, how is Kubernetes built and how do you basically deploy something in Kubernetes? Typically, the first one of the first things is because before you do any kind of coding is to basically build your own Docker images, your own container images, right? So when you do that and you write your Docker file, one of the first lines of code is you're from, right? And in this line, you basically decide, uh, design like where is your base image coming from, right? And in many cases, this is coming from public repositories. There are many out there, and Doc Docker Hub is obviously one of the most famous ones, right? So what I did is, and I'll show this to you later. Uh, I basically thought, how about I just write a pipeline? Um, in this case, I use GitLab, uh, which is downloading just the latest and greatest, uh, let's say, images like Nginx, MongoDB, uh, Node.js, Redis in the latest version and immediately doing a security scan against that, right? And uh, the output was actually uh, really interesting because even if you do this with the latest images, and let me just open my screen here and show this, even with the latest images, um, you see something like this. So this is something I was just running now earlier. I just did that here, you see this five minutes ago. I hope you can see my screen. This is my GitLab environment, right? So I basically used um, Node.js here. I was running my, my security scan against it. And you see, even in the latest versions here, we have CVEs, right? These are marked as critical. And this is not just one CVE. These are many CVEs coming out. And this is one big challenge uh, many organizations are basically facing, right? So when you get these images from public sources, you cannot really trust them, right? Because at the time when you pull them, even the latest version, they are typically uh, already vulnerabilities. And I did a similar scan for, for Node.js a few days ago, and this was really, really interesting because vulnerabilities is one thing because it needs something to exploit these vulnerabilities, right? But when I did basically um, another scan if, a while ago, I think it was one week ago, something like that, I found something very interesting here. I basically found that it's not just the vulnerability at that time, this latest image even included an infected website. Right, and if we think about that, an infected website, which is part of a public image, is really, really serious. Right? I mean, again, a vulnerability is something you need to ex exploit somehow. Right? But if it's a vulnerable website, which is there, your image is put, and you put your code into the image, you put your code into the into the supply chain and into your CI/CD, and then there is a process calling out to an infected system. Right? Pulling malicious data, and obviously, it's even more uh, problematic. Um, so this is something I found out like one week ago. I did a similar scan a few, few hours later, then it was gone. So it seems that it was fixed somehow. But uh, these kind of things are, are basically happening. So now, um, what is this all about zero trust? As I mentioned earlier, um, I want to talk today a bit about how to build a zero trusted DevOps supply chain, right? So one of the first things I need to do before I go into the details is I need to explain a bit like what is zero trust because not everybody from a developer background knows what is zero trust, right? So first of all, uh, zero trust is basically a strategy, a security strategy which has been developed years ago, right? And um, the main goal of that strategy is to eliminate trust at all levels, right? And typically in the past, this is what companies did is they basically eliminated trust on the network layer, they eliminated trust the data layer, on devices, on users, all of these things. And um, this has been followed by some key principles. One was, for example, verify uh, explicitly. The other one was basically use this privilege access. And the third one is assume breach, right? So these are the, the three key security principles which have been uh, established with zero trust. And now if you think about that and about how zero trust is working, and you try to put that 
methodology, this strategy into the new world of, um, let's say, microservices, then you will see that it doesn't really fit anymore, right? Because the entire DevOps pipeline is basically built on trust, isn't it? I mean, they are the developers in charge. They are writing the code. Then you have the, the CICD process, right? The CICD process, obviously, many people come together. They push their code into Git. Then, 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 and this can be even with, with external developers, basically, right? Then you run your CSD pipeline, you, you, you get your images from external, internal resources, right? Use packages, man managers, for example, like NPM to build things together, and you produce your artifact. So now, all of this process is somehow built on trust. And, and as such, um, implementing zero trust is actually a key strategy to prevent uh, modern and sophisticated attacks. And as I said earlier, we are seeing a lot of these modern and sophisticated attacks. So typically attacks like towards API, APIs, open APIs, for example, right? These are things you cannot prevent with traditional security anymore. You can put as many firewalls as you want into a system and you can put as many, um, like uh, even ransomware technologies or antivirus technologies in the system. It doesn't help, right? Because these attacks are completely happening on completely different layers. So implementing zero trust in a in a in a way for for the supply chain is is getting really critical. Although it is working a little bit different than what happened before when you talked about traditional zero trust. And of course, the grand strategy of of all organizations is somehow to stop all breaches, right? By leveraging a set of tactics, basically, and tools. So now, how can this be done, right? Uh, one of the first things which is very, very important is to build some sort of strategy and to basically shift security to the left, right? In, in order to do that, typically, organizations need to implement something like uh, code quality gates. Right, but these code quality gates they are not only implemented in the CI/CD. Right, this is what many organizations did in the last two or three years. They implement code quality, quality gates in the, in the CI/CD, but it doesn't stop there. Right, it's actually uh, even more important to look a little bit more to the left. What happens on the developer front, like when developers start to do the first coding before they put something into the CI/CD, but it's also important to continue this entire process until the time the data is deployed, until you have your um, production environment running in Kubernetes, right? Until you have your, your environment connected to your ingress controllers, right? So all of this needs to be connected and you need to have certain security gates within this entire ecosystem, right? So there is a security gate happening in the coding stage, a security gate happening in the build stage, the test stage, the release stage, deployed stage, but also security gate basically when you operate uh, these kind of, let's say, technologies. And another area which I want to cover here is the communication path, because it's it's one topic basically to, to build different gates into a system. At the same time, um, I mean, people are using communication tools like Slack, Jira, Confluence, you name it, right? And um, it, it's not very uncommon that even secret data or secure data is communicated over there. So we think about AWS keys, secrets, things like that, it is very easy to communicate them by a Slack, for example, right? Or via Teams. So it is really critical to import and to use this kind of like data you have there in these systems and also analyze them, right? To make sure that zero trust is not stopping in any of these areas, right? As I said before, typically organizations focus to implement zero trust in the network or on the user side and device side. Now, we need to look into a little bit more broader view, right? Because zero trust now needs to become needs to be become uh, part of the supply chain, and and also to become part of the entire operation and process. And this needs to include the communication uh, methodologies, which are basically in place in in most organizations. So how it could look like from uh, this is my last slide, by the way. Uh, how it could look like from a from a like from a process point of view is. The developers they start to do the first coding right so what happens is at that time when the coding is happening there needs to be a process in place to do a basic hygiene i usually call this in my in my conversation with customers with many people in the community i call it basic hygiene the reason is secrets api tokens misconfigurations they should be filtered out as early as possible right and this is only an in interest of devops only an in interest of developers because at the end of the day if these things are happened early 
it will help you to bring your ci cd better into production to have less issues in your ci cd process right and to have a better code quality at the end of the day right so implementing this very early is very very important and today we are focusing very detailed on this part basically after this slide i show you the the live session i show you everything how it works but this is the first step after this has been done the developers they do it like a git commit they get pushed they push this well basically into the version control and then from the version control you have your ci basically starting and uh, there are many things which can basically happen which be, yeah this basically depends on on what kind of application is deployed if this is a containerized environment, obviously you produce something like a container image, for example. If this is a serverless environment, maybe you deploy or you produce some kind of code, right? But there are certain measurements which need to follow here in that area. One, for example, is a continuous image vulnerability scanning, right? So image vulnerability scanning can start even at the time of the development, right? Think about the Docker file, look into Docker files, analyze the Docker files, look into package manager configurations, look into your, in your, in, in your NPM packages, right? These things can happen at first stage there. The second stage that can basically happen in the CI part before you build and after you build your image, right? Then after that, Kubernetes workload configuration. So whenever you have that in place, important to scan for that. Image file reputation and secrets, again, is also happening in this, in this level. Then after this has been done, let's say now we have our container image. Now it is ready to be deployed somewhere in your staging environment. Critical to look into that, provide something like a worker protection functionality, look into runtime protection, look into image scanning, especially uh, when you push this into, a, uh, into, for example, into an image repository and have some certain processes in place to make sure that only previously scanned images can be deployed later in your Kubernetes environment. Right, to have something like an admission controller, for example, which can basically control that particular part. And again, the security should not stop there. It needs to be a continuous process, right? This entire thing around zero trust, which means during the time when you operate that, have complete visibility, look for compliance standards, workload risks, and very important, especially these days, API security, right? This is basically in a, in a very few words, how you build zero trust. Right. And you will see in the next sessions and even today, I will pick up a few topics and go to the details. Right. So today I will pick up the topic about code security, developer first security. In one of my next sessions, I will basically pick up the topic about um, web API security and go there into some details. So that's basically all in slides I wanted to show. There are typically six steps which are needed in order to build such a secure code to cloud environment. First, again, look for the developers, take care of them that they are covered. The second is code quality gates in the entire CSLD process. The next typically what organizations do is posture management, then implementation of workload protection to cover the, uh, the serverless functions, the Kubernetes systems, then application API security and intelligence. So these are the things you need to know before we start and, and look into uh, all the details. And uh, this is what I want to do now. So we as Checkpoint, we basically um, acquired a solution which is called Spectral. I think it's almost one year ago. And this solution can basically provide exactly that level of visibility for developers, right? And the solution Spectral basically comes in, in, in two elements. One element is what you see now. This is our dashboard. This is basically um, one single place where you can analyze your findings, where you can interact, where you can create tickets, where you can analyze them, where you can interact with Jira, with like all these kinds of things. This is our, our, our dashboard where you analyze that. This is one part of that. The other side is basically the uh, scanner itself, right? And the scanner engine is something you run to scan your code, right? So now um, the beauty in, in Spectral is that the system itself was built from developers for developers, right? So the people who built Spectral, they have not been part of Checkpoint at that time. They just built that for the community and, uh, and commercialized that after a while. So now when you think about the process, how it works, you need to understand that there's dashboard, there's scanner, okay? So let's say I want to run a scan now against a certain code. I'm usually using this code here, and you can use also that code if you want to do some tests. It's basically in a public GitHub repository, which is in github.com slash spectral ops slash spectral code. And uh, this spectral code is basically a security test bed, 
right? So whenever you want to do some scans, this is a good place to check it here. But of course, there are many, many other, let's say, test beds, uh, test beds online. You can basically use many other GitHub projects. Uh, for one of my other use cases, I'm using, for example, Overs to 10. And I'll talk about this uh, in a bit. Okay, so let's say I want to do such a scan now. So the only thing I need to do here is I log into my portal. I basically go here to sources. And now in my in my sources, I can basically design how do I want to download my binary? How do I want to run the scan? So there are many ways how I can do this. I start with the simplest one, which is I want to do this on my CLI, right? So I, se I select from here, local repositories. And the beauty is with, uh, with Spectral, you can scan basically any code. There's no limitation in programming language. There's no limitation in terms of like, um, let's say, uh, repositories, right? As long as it's a text-based file, as long as you can open it, as long as you have access to that, you can scan it. The next good thing is in that stage that all these scans can happen online and offline, which means uh, you don't need necessarily internet access to run a scan. The only thing what you need to do is you need to download your spectral binary once, okay? And let me show you how such a spectral binary looks like. I hope you can see my screen. I just made the, the font size a bit bigger. So if I look here now into my, um, uh, into my, where is my keyboard? I have somehow, Oh, it should be fine. So if you look into this, you will basically see that I have one spectral binary here. And this spectral binary only has around 70 to 80 megabytes. And this depends a bit on the operating system. We have that for Linux, for Mac, for Windows, whatever you like. The good news is we have baked in so-called detectors. And this is the secrets, basically the detection mechanism into this binary. So there's no need to upload your code to a public system, to, a, to an internet system, internet-based system, for example. There's no need to, to exchange data uh, with any kind of public repository, right? So when you run the spectral scanner itself, all of this is happening completely local. And you can, again, you can decide, do you want to use these findings on your local machine and keep it on your local machine, or do you want to upload, upload them uh, to our a SAS platform where you do further analysis. We have both cases. We have many customers who enjoy to use our, our SAS portal. We have other customers, for example, in the finance space who say, no, we don't want to upload anything. We want to keep it completely isolated. No problem. You can cut internet access at that point. You can run the scans. You can save your, your, your results basically in JSON files, right? And then analyze it further with your own tools. So this is what I'm doing. I'm basically using my spectral um, uh, engine here now it's basically just a binary and do some example scans so i want to go back to my browser and for my browser i just pick up my uh, scanning command and this scanning command is, is pretty simple first i define a variable which is a licensing licensing check mechanism just to make sure license is in place right the second is basically my my spectra scan so let me copy that and uh, paste it here to my folder Right. Uh, what we will observe is that I have something so called like like this called in include tags and include tag basically specifies what you want to scan for. Right. So the the base, um, the base tag basically specifies I want to scan for secrets. I want to scan for API keys and for tokens. This is covered from my base flag. The next flag is audit that covers misconfigurations. There is another flag called IAC infrastructure as code depends where you want to scan right? it depends what kind of code do you have so you can extend that there are many other like flex available basically but it really depends on the case on the use case what you want to scan for so let's say now in my case i have my uh, my spectral code again this is a kind of test bed we are basically using and i want to scan that here i just run my spectral scanner you will see like um some some details like this is coming from a certain repository. Let me just go up here. Ah, it was too fast. Okay, it's it, it basically identifying what repository I'm using to scan, right? And the scan typically is very very quick, which means it runs usually within uh, five seconds. Let me do the same scan again. I just use base. Maybe that helps me already. So you see here my repo, this is my repo, <laughs> it's too fast. This is actually what most customers love because it's a very, very fast scan. 
Um, in my case, I didn't configure my 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 CLI to cover it in my my, my screens. My my size is a big bit, but it doesn't matter. Let me give you some ideas what we find here. So first of all, we highlight the the file itself where this finding has happened. Right. So in my case, this is a Terraform file. Uh, in line number one, we found this particular item. Right. And this is giving you an idea of what is behind that. Ensure, ensure that the Azure resource group has resource lock enabled. There is already a fix. So if you don't know how to fix that, you can just pick it up from the node. If you want to find out more about this particular finding, you can just open this web page. And in this web page, we basically provide you more details behind this particular finding here. If you want to know directly from the Terraform provider, this is directly linked to Terraform, right? So this is one example from Terraform. But again, it's not just about Terraform. This is uh, basically for many, many other uh, findings. Uh, what we can provide, we can look for API keys, we can look for secrets, and so on. And I'll show this to you in a bit. Um, but the main idea is that you get all these details first on the CLI. So now, since this is a test, but I have lots of findings, obviously, right? And now developers can start to fix these kind of things before that they push that basically in production. As I mentioned, these um, these findings can be populated also in our SAS portal. So if I think this 31 matches are too much to mention on my uh, on my CLI, I can just move to my uh, SAS portal. And for my SAS portal in my dashboard, I have a, the, the option to create these kind of groups, right? So let's say my DevOps team needs a special group, my front-end team a special group, and my back-end team, and so on. So I can create different groups for that, and I can assign scans and users to these different groups. And behind these groups, I can basically configure some kind of actions. For example, uh, a Slack ticket needs to, a Slack, uh, a Slack message needs to be initiated once I have a finding. Or something like, I want to open a Jira ticket. Or for example, I want to, um, want to do some other activities, right? So I can basically build these kind of automations behind these groups. But let's say now, I just want to see what happened in my scan. I can open my scan here, right? You see, this is my, my scan of my repo, what I basically did. This scan happened actually uh, two minutes ago, and I decided this is part of my team front end, right? So now here you have all these findings. It's very easy to understand. So now we have, for example, a visible private key. And if I want to learn more about this private key, I just need to click on it, which is redirecting me to another web page. And now you see more details about that. This is a visible private key. For somebody who's not aware of what is that, there is a description for that. We have the problem statement, right? And then there is the fix. And of course, usually for, for traditional keys, the fix is to use the cloud native secret store, store something like uh, like uh, HashiCorp Vault, for example, or something like uh, CyberArk Vault, right? So that's one example. Another example is, uh, let's let's pick something up that I did not before, an AWS key, for example. We can pick it up. You see here, clear description. What is that? It's a cloud credential. It is an AWS key, but also applies to other things like Google Cloud tokens, Oracle Cloud tokens, and so on. Depends, right? So we have for each of these things, we have our own descriptions and our own, let's say, um, uh, recommendations, how you can mitigate these kind of findings and how you can basically fix them. So now let's say that in, in, my, in this case, you want to create a Jira ticket from here, right? So the easiest thing how to do that is click on Actions, create Jira issue. Okay. So now I can select my project and I created my own Jira account. That's why I have this here. I can say this is, for example, a bug. And I can just add my uh, summary, which is spectral here in this particular repository, right? We have a visible AWS key, right? So I create my ticket. And once this is done, I basically have it in Jira. I can go back here. I can go to Jira. I can go to all issues. Now let me just search again. You see now here, I have my ticket open in Jira. Now I can assign that to a certain person, to a certain developer to fix this kind of problem. After it has been done, I just go back. I click on this one. I go to resolve and it will disappear from my system. It will be now listed actually here as resolved. I can look into them and see this is where I already worked on in, in this particular environment, right? So it is very easy to integrate that into the developer flow. So now, as I mentioned earlier, scanning in, uh, let's say, um, and repository is one thing, right? But what happens if, for whatever reason, 
um, the individual who wrote this code really needs or wants to transmit that secret, this AWS key, this kind of like thing which is protected, right, to somebody else, okay? So maybe they do it in Slack, right? So what we did is, what I can do is I can integrate um, the same kind of scanning I did on the CLI now, I can, can integrate it into Slack, right? So we have something called um, a, a Slack application. We can actually connect here, so-called Slack bot, and uh, this Slack bot is basically scanning Slack channels, right? And analyzing the Slack channels. So now, where do we run the workload? You can run the workload, which is our, our, our Spectra scanner, essentially. You can run that in a Docker environment, a Dockerized environment, right? For example, you own Kubernetes, or you can run it as a Lambda function. We provide both of that. So let's say now my developer, the person who's in charge, really wants to send uh, this AWS key to somebody else. I just take that up, I open my Slack. Right here, you see I have already some channels. This is the one I'm using usually. Let's say I have a budget planning or I'm using these demos, have fun. Here is my AWS key, right? So I just need to, here, let's see what will happen. It takes usually a few seconds until it's picking up. And now I see already on my mobile phone, I have the message already. Interesting is in my Slack app on the Mac, it always takes a little bit longer until it appears, but I can go already here to my, um, yeah, now it is here. You see now in my in my in my Slack, I see this is a it's coming out as a notification. Number one, you can basically click on it, then we will redirect it to the message, and you see this is the the place that we basically picked it up and we basically found that. So now, if you go to the original place, you will see that this has been now removed, and you can decide what kind of like text you want to put as a replacement for the secret. So it's not just that we scan basically any kind of code or any kind of programming language. It goes even further because we can integrate into collaboration tools, as mentioned, like Slack. We can do the same thing basically in Jira. So if you want to uh, to scan Jira, it's, it's the same way possible, no limitation about that, right? And many other systems. So let me pick up another use case, which is also very, very famous and actually happening many times. And that use case is about integrating into CICD and how to deal with external developers, because this is something I, I hear this many times and speak to different organizations. So first of all, of course, if developers are within company, you can enforce company policies. You can tell them you need to use Spectre. You can implement this as a Git commit hook, for example, right? To make sure that the code is scanned, you have the code hygiene in order to build this zero trusted DevOps supply chain, right? So now what happens if you have external developers? It happens, right? So one thing what you can do is, you can integrate basically in um, in uh, directly in GitHub. So what we have is similar like to our Slack integration, we have an, a GitHub bot, right? And this GitHub bot can be triggered on a number of circumstances. And one circumstance could be a pull request. It's a very typical thing. Many developers work together, external developers, you pull that together, you create a pull request, right? And from here, I did that. I created basically a file, this code1.3.py. And I basically started this pull request. And now you see here, in, in my case, my pull request actually has triggered this application, this embedded GitHub application to run. So now if I want to see what happened, I can just click on details, right? I see here, there was one issue detected by my spectral uh, integration. This was a visible AWS key. It is in this file, and now I want to view the code, I want to see it, and I can only see that because I have access to it, of course, to my repository, is this is my AWS key, right? So this is a good solution to integrate uh, external developers, right? Because this is an ongoing topic. Um, at the end of the day, most companies, they, they usually like have a mix of, of like internal people, external people, but it's a, it's a good way how such an integration can happen. Another way of integration, as I mentioned earlier, is to integrate directly into the CICD, but then we already move a little bit from the far left or developer side to the CICD, right? So we move a little bit from the left to the right. Um, here we have many, many different options. Basically, there's no limitation of uh, whatever CICD you have in your mind, since the only thing you need to do is download the binary, run it. That's all, right? So it's very simple to write a, a pipeline for that. So let's say you want to see how it looks like in GitLab. You can click on GitLab. You get all the uh, necessary 
um, let's say, steps which are needed to protect your certain pipeline, right? And um, the only thing is basically define your spectral DSN, which is essentially your 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 license, right? This is this this string here, and uh, and then basically you just integrate that as a as another like security gate within uh, the CI/CD, right? So so I did that, and I showed you one example earlier in GitLab. Let me show you another example in in one of my famous systems, which is Azure DevOps pipelines. So I wrote actually um, a very simple pipeline here in, in Azure DevOps. And as I mentioned also earlier, I'm using um, an application here called um, Juice Shop, Overstore 10 Juice Shop. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but this Overstore 10 Juice Shop is a very interesting project because it's, as they say, it, it's one of the most modern, sophisticated, insecure web applications, right? So for me, as a security professional, perfect. Right, because I have an application I can use, I can do penetration tests, I can use it as a honeypot. Many use cases already in my mind immediately. So I've wrote an, uh, basically an automation, which is uh, pulling the, the latest repo from, uh, from, from their GitHub account, pushing this in my, um, in my Azure DevOps, in my Azure DevOps integrated repo, right? Then I basically use that to do some code modification. Then I push this into my CSD. My CSD is doing a few things. The first is my CSD is actually like building this container image from scratch, right? It's generating an artifact, which is my container image itself. And in the next stage is pushing this into, um, into a um, container image repository. In my case, this is basically in Azure, right? And from there, I basically create a, a simple deployment, which is pushing it also in, in Kubernetes, right? So this is basically the flow. It's a very simple thing. And there's a bit more around that. But as I focus today only on the on the on the on the very shift left part on the on the secret scanning on the code scanning, uh, I keep here. When we talk about API and web security, then we have a bit more to talk about since uh, this is an OWASP.10 Zoo shop. There are many interesting things you can do with that. But today, again, I want to focus on this. So let's just open this security scanning part here, and we see like the only thing I do is I download my binary. Right, this is super simple. I run that. Once it's done, I run my spectra scan. I find all these details here. I can stop my pipeline now. I can analyze them, right? So these are like things you can easily integrate. And this is just another example how such an, such an integration uh, can basically look like. If you want to see a bit more details, like how does the code look like, for example, for this pipeline, we can, uh, we can basically go here into the pipeline. We can edit this one. Right, and then you basically see that the, the integration is super simple. I just integrated another stage, which is my scanning stage, and uh, I made it dependent on the build stage. Right, and here I just defined things like download that one, right, basically directly from, from our Spectra website, um, and run it. That's basically everything. All these parameters are basically defined in the uh, as variables, obviously, right, to make the entire process. Uh, very smooth. What you also see is I have something here like a dash dash OK flag. And the reason is simply that I want to, my pipeline to continue. Again, I have a small story behind this, <laughs> behind this particular juice shop, because in my mind is, of course, always I want to secure everything from code to cloud, right? So I want to continue with this pipeline, even in the event that there are malicious things. And since I'm using the overst.10 juice shop, yes, I have vulnerabilities, of course. Yes, I have secrets, of course. I know that, right? So I continue with that and I use this more or less to build a nice honeypot, which is then protected by our web and API, uh, web app and, uh, API service. But aside from that, it's a very simple integration to build basically uh, Spectral uh, directly uh, into here, right? So you see there are many cases how this can basically happen. So now if you go back to, to Spectral, I talked to you how it looks like in GitLab. I showed you now how it looks basically in, in Azure DevOps. But again, there are many other options. Another option I didn't even talk about that is, is an integration to IDEs. And there's one example basically mentioned here. There are many others we support, but Visual Studio Code is at least one of the uh, most famous ones. So let's say you want to do this basic hygiene directly in the IDE, which I can recommend. Very easy. You just need to move to my uh, IDE here. This is my IDE, right? So um, in this case, 
I am just using the same spectral board, but I, I added a few files to see like there's a multi-client Docker, there's a Docker file and so on, right? So, so you see, I was integrating this and now I'm able here, even in my Visual Studio code, to get all these details. I see basically things like, uh, this is my availability token, I can click onto that. I see this is my Docker file. Here we basically have uh, some sort of findings, right? And this is the basic hygiene I'm talking about, right? So when I was talking in the beginning about how to build such a, such a zero trusted DevOps supply chain, this is exactly how you should usually start, right? To build this hygiene. Let me just bring this up again, right? Build hygiene. Oh, this is even better. Make sure you, the code you get and you push into your CSD is already cleaned up before you continue with other steps. And again, I'm not doing something super, super difficult here, right? It is really important to make these kind of steps at that point, because later when many developers come and put content together, then again, then they're using things like NPM, they're using different package managers, they're building applications, things get more complex, right? And and the more you can do on the shift on the, on the, on the deep shift left side, the easier it is at the end of the day to build that um, zero trusted supply chain. Another very important topic I just want to highlight here is, and this is just um, also my personal observation. I know many organizations invested in many tools in this area. They bought a tool for the CICD, they bought a tool for the, the code scanning, they bought a tool basically for Kubernetes, right? But now there's the big butt coming, right? What happens if you get an information like in my image registry, I found a vulnerable image with a certain vulnerability. What can you do with that? Think about it. Not much, right? You just see there is a certain vulnerability within my image. But my question I have in my mind at this time is always, number one, where's this image coming from? Which CICD basically processed that, right? Which development team was in charge maybe, right? Um, which version is that? Where did I see this kind of like uh, threat before it basically appeared in in my in my in my image registry? Correct. These are things I need to. I wonder. I need to look into when I want to build something like a zero trusted environment. On the other side, um, I need to think a bit about the right. I mean, about the site once it's deployed. So now I have my vulnerable image. I need to ask myself: Where is it deployed? Is it in dev? Is it in QA? Is it in prod? Right? Um, is it somehow exposed? Are there even APIs exposed out there by using this particular image? So these are all the questions I need to keep, need to keep under consideration. And what we as Checkpoint do, just, just to give us some, some feedback, we as Checkpoint have one platform, one ecosystem. You just need to plug in, basically uh, plug in like, like modules for each of these different elements. So if many customers, many organizations say, okay, let's start in the code stage. Then we do exactly that. We do this integration to code base. We integrate that into the platform and bring this up in life. And typically, it's a big wow effect for companies when they run that or even for individuals because at the end of the day, uh, it will show you your public blind spots. So let's say you have a certain number of, um, of public repositories and you want to scan them. It's very easy, right? Because in, in Spectral, let me just go to Spectral here, you can not just scan a folder or a file or a local repo. You can even scan an entire GitHub repo. You can scan an entire GitHub organization. If you want, you can scan even external GitHub organizations. So I did this in some of my tests. Uh, you see this here. This is basically my spectral demo. What I do is I scan Disney, right? So I found, okay, let's see what Disney has, right? So if I look to it, this is what I did for this Disney. You see there, uh, I did this for infrastructure as code, for example. And then I see lots of details, right? So since this, this data is public, everybody can do it, right? So why not doing that for, for, for your organization, for, for the place where you are working or for your own projects at the end of the day, right? To get this visibility and to fix it before it becomes basically a security risk and a more even severe topic. And in order to enable you to make that happen, I basically thought I give everybody who wants here in the community access to a demo account, right? Where you can basically play around with that and I know this is a lot of content and you get yourself a bit familiar with it. So I created one account. Let me just look into that. Uh, okay, it takes a second because I'm scanning this website, right? So let me just look in here. But this is a tenant I just created specifically for Meetup Madness, right? So now what I can do is for you, I can onboard you here to this account, right? This is active for six months. 
So there's no charge, nothing. This is active for six months. You can use this and you can use this to scan your own assets. There's only one thing you need to take under consideration. Please don't scan the most secure assets now directly from your company, right? Because at the end of the day, this is a public account for the community. Maybe you don't want that somebody else is seeing that. So when I scan something here, of course, everybody can see it. So this is more for you to get you familiar with that, to get an idea how you can use that. If you have your personal projects, you want to scan them, go ahead, use it, right? The second thing, if you really want to scan something secret, which nobody can see and you want to use this now, as I mentioned earlier, you can use it even offline. There is a flag in the, in the Spectra scanner that you can avoid sending the data back to the portal, right? Also, this is possible. But as I mentioned, everybody here who's attending this session can have access to this particular like system. I have it up and running until I think June, June 1 next year. This should be enough time to get an idea how it works. And maybe it helps you already to get this kind of visibility for your public blind spots. Because when I think from a security point of view, this is always what I want to provide. This is value, right? That you see immediately, I have my public blind spots for all my GitLab uh, or GitHub projects, right? I get this immediately, this information. It takes less than five seconds to run to such a scan. And immediately you have something that you can basically work on to make your code even more secure, right? And again, this is one part, one single part of the process, how to build such a, um, let's say, zero trusted supply chain. It's not everything, right? It's the beginning. It's the basic hygiene, what I think makes definitely sense for individuals who do development, for organizations, everybody who's somehow contributing in that process. And with that, I think I'm almost in, in one hour. I want to open for, for QA, for questions. And, and of course, I'm, I'm here to, to be ready to answer them. We've had a bit of uh, back and forth uh, in the chat there as well. Uh, and Nils, I don't know if you want to have a look. We were, so we can talk about... Yes. Oh, there are many questions in the chat. I didn't see yeah, that. No, so I've, I've been answering them. So I, I think that uh, Yung Cheng and Vinit, uh, uh, maybe one other... Uh, uh, there was a question around um, what IAC templates uh, were scannable. Mm -hmm. I was basically saying that that, I mean, there's a range of them, but effectively we're not really limited to what the template format is because we're actually just looking for the data within those templates more than anything, right? Right, correct, correct, correct. This is this is uh, it's basically a great question because what we embedded in, in our like spectral binary are these so-called detectors. So we are describing with detectors um, how, let's say, a finding looks like. Right. This finding can be an AWS key, it can be something from infrastructure as code or different like conditions, it can be something about abilities. No? So this is baked into the binary directly. And it doesn't matter for it actually what, what kind of like code you have uh, and, and where you scan. This is completely independent from that. And it's one of the, the key advantages of using uh, basically such a, such a tool, right? Because it helps you to get this kind of visibility. But um, do, do we do, uh, By the way, there's another thing okay. I want to highlight here before we continue. I mentioned, maybe didn't mention the number. We have 5,000 detectors, 5,000 as of now. But let's say you have some, your own secrets, your own, let's say, definitions, right? And I see this a lot in the finance space where my banks have their own secret source, their own secret code. They want to make sure that this is really kept private, right? You can even build your own custom detectors. So you can write a, a YAML file. You can you have you can provide you the instructions how to do that. Basically, it's a it's a mix of regex and machine learning how this works. But we 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 have this very open this kind of process how it is happening. And then you can write your own custom detectors and include that in your scan to make it even more customized for your project. Good stuff. I was just going to ask a question around uh, scanning binaries. I know that it's come up before. I don't think it was a question that these guys asked, but. Um... Yeah, this is a very good question. So we are not scanning binaries, mm -hmm. to make that clear. We are scanning everything text-based. Um, if you want to scan binaries, obviously, um, you need to do some sort of like reverse engineering, right? Because at the time when you have the binary, you just, you know, you don't see what kind of code is in there. So that's something we're not doing. Um, there are other tools basically for this, but typically this is also nothing you can do in a five second scan. It's a little bit a different process, which even uh, uses forensic uh, analysis tools. 